<laughs> Welcome, friends, to this evening of horror with your host, GM Danielson. I say, is everybody enjoying that scary lighthouse movie with Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson? I must say that it is my favorite horror movie of 2019, or at least vies to be my favorite. In celebration of the rather obscure subject of horrific lighthouses, I present to you, friends, this selection of creepy lighthouse stories from the other side. I hope you enjoy, friends. <laughs> Just don't look for the light at the end of a particular tunnel, if you know what I mean. <laughs> The Lighthouse by Hashbanger. My name is Christian Turner, and I'm currently stationed at the Sakonet Point Lighthouse due to a recent repair request. I'm writing this log on my phone as I'm unable to return to shore, and I cannot seem to access the internet or make calls which is unusual, as I've done so for a number of times at this location. I've been doing maintenance on lighthouses for almost ten years now, and I'm extremely familiar with most along the New England seaboard. Tonight was only the first night that my cell phone call lost connection at Sakonet, but also the first time in my entire career that I've been stranded. I had decided to respond to the maintenance request tonight, even though it could have waited. I always have 14 hours to respond to this level of request, and could have gotten some sleep before responding, but I had hoped that I might end up with a clear day tomorrow if I wrapped up this job tonight. That hope was smashed once I corrected the issue with the lightning system and returned to find my skiff unresponsive. I spent an hour trying to get the engine started without luck. Then I repeatedly tried calling my boss, Jack, also without luck. I tried to text, WhatsApp, Facebook, or otherwise ping anyone, until finally the sun began to set behind me. It was at this point that I realized I was in for a rough night. Jack would never realize that I was missing until tomorrow. Once 5 p.m. hit, Jack was always halfway into a bottle of his namesake. Tomorrow he would notice he would check my computer and see the open ticket. Then they would come. I kept telling myself this as I headed back to the skiff to grab what remained of my stuff, mostly repair equipment, but luckily also a few personal items that would come in handy. One of these was my Kindle. I began to read after settling into a corner. I read for maybe two hours as I became more aware of the storm's arrival. At first, it was like a low unease, a queasy stomach threatening to make you move more swiftly at any moment. It grew to a growl, then to a raging torrent of wind and salt water. Soon enough, as the lighthouse was pelted by a torrent of projectiles, lightning began to flash, and once again the light in my station failed a second time, and I was cast into darkness. For an hour amidst the absolute riot that the wind and rain were making against the windows, I tried to repair the systems, once again without luck. I slammed the access panel shut, giving up as I had exhausted all typical checks for failed systems. I made my way around to the eastern window and watched the unearthly madness spreading across the water before me. It was then that I saw her. It must have taken me several minutes to recognize and accept what I was seeing. I stared at a still figure. My mind began to flicker through possibilities for what the shape was and how it could be where it was. At the end, my eyes slowly passed from the top of her head to her feet until the shape of her little toes removed any question from my mind. There was a little girl 
maybe six years old, standing on the rocks at the base of the lighthouse, surrounded by ocean on all sides. She had dark hair, darker eyes, and was completely unclothed. I could almost feel the stings on her skin as the rain pelted her little body. My body acted immediately. I can't remember descending the staircase whatsoever. I was outside in a flash, but I slowed as I approached her from behind, visually tracing the twist and turn of her wet hair before the lightning. I tapped her shoulders softly as to not upset her. She turned and without meeting my eyes opened her arms. Even in this extreme situation, even with life and death at stake, I was very uncomfortable picking up this naked child. I did so anyway, holding her head against my shoulder as I ran back upstairs, as if to hide her from sight so that no one would see a middle-aged man carrying an innocent child, as if a Dateline helicopter was above those dark clouds. I felt only slightly better once I had her upstairs wearing my t-shirt, socks, and flannel. That felt a bit more normal. Safe. She was cold but seemed to be breathing normally. She seemed calm but wholly present. She was not shivering. I had asked her to wiggle her fingers and toes, which made her giggle. All digits looked responsive and healthy. Then I asked her what her name was. She simply stared at me. The storm outside subsided and then returned even more forcefully. My head dropped from her gaze, unable to meet her eyes. It felt like deference at the time. It still does. Sweetie, what's your name? I tried again, looking up. Again she stared quietly, but then shot up as lightning struck violently to the east. The storm! She screamed with glee as she pressed her face against the windows. I gently urged her back from the window. I tried to ask her name again and ask her how she had gotten here. I asked if she was on a boat today, if she had been swimming, anything I could think of. But she shared nothing. She would only stare quietly or point at the windows exclaiming storm or the storm. I tried to explain to her that we would have to sleep here tonight and that tomorrow I would take her home. She seemed to understand. I did my best to soften the floor with my sweatshirt, and we used the space blanket in my emergency kit to keep us warm. Somehow, even with the hard floor punishing my hips and the cold from the concrete leaching into my bones, I still fell asleep quite quickly after I heard the little girl's breathing change. I dreamt of thunder, thunder that could topple stone walls, thunder that would wipe suburban homes from their roots and lightning. Lightning that scorched the earth for miles, that would turn animals from their burrows in flames. Hail that would tear flesh and freeze the breath right from your lungs. I awoke, gasping for air. The room was glowing softly from the aftermath of a recent lightning flash, and I could see immediately that she was gone. She had been against my chest with my arm over her to keep her warm and now she was nowhere to be seen. There was nowhere she could have possibly gone. I shot up and peered through the window to see her right back where I had found her. This time she was clothed in my now soaked shirt. This time she was doing moving. Her little hand was extended before her, making scooping motions to come out with her in the rain. She was beckoning me. My eyes raised, and my head turned to see what she was calling upon. There was a Coast Guard cutter absolutely cruising towards us. Looking back, I think perhaps it was cruising to her, not us. But in that moment, I saw rescue. I saw warm blankets and a hotel. I saw the hamburger and fries that I had so sorely wanted for dinner. I watched as those hopes were dashed. They were dashed as the cutter failed to slow on approach when it tore a solid third of its hull against the rocks to the northwest of East Island. I watched in horror 
as the lights at the tip of the mast dipped and then were submerged under the waves. It happened so fast. One moment I thought I had seen a flashing light on a deck, and on the next there was nothing left. Nothing. I won't say that I snapped. I didn't. There was no violent reaction, no anger and blindness. But something did happen at that moment. I felt it. I even think I heard it. On autopilot, I walked downstairs, sullen and sure. I carefully navigated the wet rocks until I reached her once again from behind. I stopped. I did not reach out. Who are you? I asked, this time with an unacceptable level of acceptance. She turned towards me. The lightning flashed behind her. The thunder shook her little toes, and her eyes met mine. I told you, I am the storm, she smiled. The Lighthouse Keepers by Socialist 7 My grandfather was a sailor from Scotland, and he told me this story when I was a kid. He has since passed away, but I'll never forget the tale he told me. Off the west coast of Scotland, there is a lighthouse situated on a small, remote island. The lighthouse is the only building on the island, the rest of it being windswept moorland. The nearest mainland is almost 50 miles away. Nowadays nobody lives on the island, and the lighthouse is operated by an automated system. But back in the 1930s when my grandfather was a young apprentice sailor, the lighthouse needed three lighthouse keepers to live on the island and to operate the great light and guide passing ships down the coast to their ports. Three men would live and work on the remote island in rotations of three months. Our generation would find this hard to imagine, stuck on a remote island with only two men for company for months on end. No television, no internet, only books and conversation. Even though radio existed, the lighthouse board eventually could not spare the expense of a two-way radio for the men to keep in touch with the outside world. 1930s Scotland was a poorer place than we acknowledge today. The light was powered at the time by paraffin gas. At that date, the light consumed 20 barrels a year. Every month, on the first Saturday of the month, a ship would sail from the mainland and dock at the lighthouse island, providing the men with fresh water, tinned food, paraffin for the light, and news from the outside world. My grandfather was a young apprentice sailor, working on one of these supply ships. In spite of the obvious boredom, the men did not seem to mind their job. They were well paid, bearing in mind that this was the height of the Great Depression, when employment reached 40% in Scotland, and they worked in rotations of three, so after their contract was up, they would return to their families, and another team would take over. The biggest downside was the weather the biting cold and the gale-force winds that would often confine the men inside the lighthouse for days at a time. And if anything went wrong, there was no boat for the men to escape the island, and no way to send word to the outside world. My grandfather used to enjoy the monthly supply runs to the lighthouse island. It broke up the monotony of his usual trips carrying goods between ports. The men were always delighted to see their guests, the men from the supply ship would be invited ashore and would join the keepers in the lighthouse's tiny canteen for a drink of whiskey, sometimes several. Even though my grandfather was in his mid-teens, he was allowed a whiskey or two. It was a different time. The December of 1934 began uneventfully. On the first Saturday of the month, the supply ship visited the remote lighthouse as usual and delivered their cargo. Nothing was untoward, and the men seemed to be in good spirits. The first record that something was untoward occurred on December 15th, 
when a Norwegian ship sailing down the coast to Liverpool noticed that the light was not shining at all from the lighthouse. When they reached Liverpool, they reported it to the port authorities who made a record of it in the incident log, but nothing else was done. Around the 22nd of December, a fishing vessel, heading home due to increasingly stormy weather conditions, noticed that the light was out of the lighthouse. When the fishing vessel arrived at Aberdeen, they reported it to the authorities again. On Christmas Eve, a relief vessel was ordered to inspect conditions on the light, but could not sail due to inclement weather, so it had to turn back. They got sufficiently close to the island to notice that the light was still out, but could not approach due to large, dangerous waves. Due to it being Christmas, the next relief vessel wasn't launched until December 27th. My grandfather was aboard this vessel. Several local men from the mainland had been drafted to help out on board in case of an emergency. The weather was still icy cold, windy, and raging sleet, but after hours of debating, the men sailed anyway. When they approached the tiny island, it was late afternoon and the light was fading away. They saw the lighthouse towering over the empty island pitch black against the darkening sky. No light to be seen. They pulled up to the little dock and went ashore. The door to the lighthouse was open and swinging in the wild wind. Holding their lamps, my grandfather and the crew headed inside. All of the place's gas lamps had gone out. The sailors quickly relit them to aid their search. In the tiny kitchen, the table was set for lunch. Plates, cutlery, and cups were neatly set out on the table. A pot of broth, which had since gone moldy, was still in the pot on the unlit stove. Upon searching the bedrooms, they found the beds unmade, but the closet full of clothes. The winter coats and oilskins were still in the cupboard. Even the men's regulation boots were still out by the door, The keepers would categorically not have left the safety and warmth of the lighthouse in a Scottish December without their coats and oilskins. The sailors searched every nook and cranny of the lighthouse, but the keepers were nowhere to be found. So the men went back outside, and while there was still light, searched the rest of the island. The tiny island was about fourteen acres of featureless, empty moor, so there really was nowhere for a man to hide or be hidden. Peering over the cliffs, they gazed down at the rocks and the sea, but there was no trace of any living soul. The three lighthouse keepers seemed to have simply vanished. Upon returning to the lighthouse, one of the sailors found the lighthouse's logbook in a drawer. The log was filled with the normal, boring entries about the weather and passing ships. The log ended on December 14th, the day before the first ship noticed the light was out. That entry read, December 14th, 1934. High winds southwesterly. A ship passed, could not identify the flag. Odd colors, matched nothing in the flag codebook. Ship stopped suddenly and inexplicably then continued on its way seemingly bound for Belfast. The lighthouse log ended here. The sailors and my grandfather headed back to the ship and sailed back to shore to make their report. The news spread fast and reached the missing men's wives and families. A navy ship was sent out the next day to do a more intensive search of the island and the surrounding waters, but they found no trace of the men. No bodies were ever found. Several theories abound as to the fate of the three lighthouse keepers. Some believe they were swept overboard by a freak wave, but if that was the case, why would they have been outside with no coats in December? The lighthouse itself was undamaged. Some believed one of the men went mad and killed his companions. If so, how did he escape the island with no boat? The final log entry led some to speculate it must have been a foreign ship who abducted the men, with what purpose no one has ever been able to explain. 
Some even blame aliens or some sort of mythical sea monster. I asked my grandfather what he thought, and he replied, If I told you, you'd think I was crazy. I didn't ask him again, and now, sadly, he's no longer around to ask. The Lighthouse in the Woods by Garface 111 The trip to my mother's is an arduous one. The journey's length is not entirely the fault of sheer distance, but rather the perilous, winding labyrinth of roads that twist through the thick New England woods. Nestled deep within Maine, Pine Hill claims the title of one of the state's oldest logging towns, and so unique was this town's isolation that one could drive all day, once exiting Route 59 in Bridgewater and still not arrive at the dilapidated general store, sitting dutifully at the heart of the small collection of wooden cabins and old machinery. Pine Hill had its fair share of history, but since most of the industry moved upstate to New York in the late 60s, it had largely fallen off the map becoming even more isolated than it used to be. Having grown up in the town and witnessing its decline, I always felt as though the solemnity of the endless pine forest was not as unforgiving as many of the fleeing members of the community so vocalized. My mother never felt so lonely, situated upon Red Hawk Hill, a short twenty-minute drive from the general store, and therefore the town itself. When my father left her, she had told me in a fit of crying that he didn't just leave her, but the life they had built together in Pine Hill. And so it was of great surprise to me that the day after Hurricane Sue had wiped out the last of the infrastructure of that small community, she had called me once, her voice frail but resolute in the wish to finally leave the area and come to live in Connecticut with my fiancé and me. I thought she'd die there, it was late August when Alice and I packed moving crates into the 1994 Honda my father had left me and began the long road trip from our suburban stronghold in North Connecticut. I knew, of course, she didn't want to do this. She didn't want to lose a weekend to chores. But she came all the same, never once complaining about my mother or the musky smell of her deteriorating home. I loved her for this, and for many other reasons besides. She had wanted an autumn wedding, and I wanted to please her in any way I could. When I asked her to marry me earlier that year, I told her that she was the most fascinating and special person in my life, and without her, I would certainly fade away. She jumped into my arms and kissed me so hard that I could still feel the blood pounding in her lips. The first leg of the trip ended quickly, with me in the driver's seat as the concrete playgrounds of the more densely populated areas slowly crept away from the highway and were replaced with large expanses of wheat and grass highlighted by the occasional cow. It was midday, and the sun beat down on the green pastures in ways that brought great waves of heat to my attention. When we finally veered away from Route 59, it was late afternoon, and our trip was only half over. Before we knew it, we were driving underneath the boughs of countless pines, their green mass of branches obscuring the soft pink hue of the sunset. The automatic headlights of my car came on, and the station we had turned in left range. A deep silence grew between my fiancé and me. When driving through the woods at night, one's mind starts to wander, the headlights of the car interact with the matrix of tree trunks in ways to assist the jumps and conclusions so typical of the dark. In your mind's eye, a simple bush or knot becomes a face. Someone unaccustomed to the woods can suffer this in the most extreme fashion. The headlights carve swaths of visibility into that utter darkness of the woods, like two spotlights endlessly searching. In these illuminated parts, 
Your eyes can utter indescribable things, but only for a moment, for in the next there is a new area under scrutiny, and the things that were seen previously have all but faded into memory in the pines. My fiancé broke the silence with a slight gasp, not one that was forced, but a gasp of involuntary nature. What was that? Did you see it? Her voice lacked the surefire confidence it normally exuded, and it perturbed me. It was frail and worried. I could only play it off casually, but so queer was this reaction from her that I instantly knew something was amiss. A deer? No, no, not a deer. It was like a dog. It looked right at me. Not a dog, but a person? <sighs> the woods has an unforgiving nature to those unfamiliar. Babe, a coyote or a wolf, I promise. I know what a coyote looks like. I know what they are. <sighs> what that was, it, it wasn't either. I consciously loosened my grip on the steering wheel. It was peculiarly sweaty. This drive always has me seeing things, babe. It's been a long day. Take a nap. When you wake, we'll be there in no time. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see her face. The face of the woods. I remembered this drive. The acceleration of each turn was calming to some degree, and even the stress emanating from Alice's now curled up body began to subside. It was hypnotizing, the weight of the steering wheel and the response of the pedal. So hypnotizing, in fact, that when my eyes fell upon the milky white orbs in the woods, I could barely register. Every human comes hardwired with the understanding that eye contact is an innate experience shared between two conscious beings. A split second can feel like an hour-long argument or a night of romance even an inside joke. The eye contact felt what this creature was, for lack of better words, violating. It took the trust and mutual understanding of gaze into someone's thoughts and turned it into an assault. An assault on my core ideology. An attack on not who I was, but who I wanted to be. There was a deep horror in it. A horror that stayed outside my awareness, and by the time I understood what was going on, I was screaming, yelling without purpose. It had taken something from me, stolen something. What's happening? What's going on? It, it, it was there. I saw it there, in the woods. I heaved and choked out the words. The car slowed to a crawl. The two spotlights illuminating the trees finally found their target. The coyote? N no, 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 no. That wasn't a coyote. I told her what I saw. The milky white eyes situated vertically over a wide, fleshy smile. An exaggerated human mouth, drooling and foaming. It wasn't a dog, though. It was a hyena, a hyena with eyes the size of ping-pong balls and the vertical, flat face of a person. Its smile, the way it looked at me. Alice cut me off. Like it knew you, it knew everything about you. I started driving again. We sat in silence for a long while, neither of us knowing how to proceed in this situation. After what seemed like an interminable quiet, Alice cut the tension with her now ragged voice. How far is it to your mother's? Forty-five, thirty minutes now? It's hard to tell at night. We don't have a single landmark. The woods just seem to go on in perpetuity. Will it be safe there? What do we need to do? We need to talk about this, Martin. We'll... we'll, we'll be safe there. There are neighbors, and my mother, and... 
I trailed off, lost in thoughts of the white, boxy teeth grinning at me. Your mother can't even move by herself. What the hell is she going to do? Listen to me, Alice. You and I both saw what we saw, but we still have no idea what it was or what it was capable of. For all we know, it was a man in a mask or, or a wild animal. Everything is going to be just fine. My words filled the empty car, lingering long after they had dissipated. They didn't sound like me, though. They belonged to someone else. A liar. I'm gonna put on the car radio. Let's focus on something else. As I reached for the stereo, I forced an exhale. A long, deep breath to let out all the tension and fear I had been building since Alice first saw the creature. And just as my brain lost oxygen and my mind focused on nothing, Alice screamed. A massive thud battered the top of the car. Oh God, oh God. There was blood on the windshield. The brakes whined. Alice and I got out of the car, still in shock. The surrounding forest was pitch black. The headlights of the car fixed on the road ahead, their beams of yellow luring countless insects into view. The front of the car was bent and bruised. Blood coagulated on the bumper and windshield. Alice and I turned and looked behind us. A long trail of blood tracked 15 feet behind, then vanished. It's alive, Alice muttered. She stalked back to the car, a lighthouse piercing through the black void. All doubt had left me. All semblance of control was gone. I drove in a panic. Something was out there, hopefully curled up, dying. I accelerated into each turn faster and faster. Almost in jest, Alice spoke. Is that you? Did you defecate yourself? She was beyond all comprehension. Martin, did you defecate yourself? No, and I don't understand what you're getting at. Jesus, it smells like your mother's, like shit and, and mildew. The cork was gone. My heartbeat pounded in my lips. I screamed at the woods. Crazy? Do you know what's crazy? How we have failed this test. We have failed. And now look. Now you are still failing us. We need to stay calm. She looked at me with eyes on fire. Then she covered her mouth and nose with her shirt. Suddenly, I smelled it too. The thought crossed my mind. In my moment of terror, I had defecated myself? I checked to no success. The smell got worse, louder and angrier. Alice began to cough. Roll down the windows, she yelled. I pawed at the door controls, the smell blinding me. This stench, this putrid miasma circulating the cabin, its origin unknown. It choked me. I couldn't even get a whole breath in. Each spasm my diaphragm produced only worsened the effect. I had never considered the horror of choking to death. How terrifying it is, how claustrophobic. I slammed on the brakes and flew open the door. The car screeched to a stop and we stumbled to the dirt road onto our knees. Alice was throwing up, retching. The sound of her stomach convulsing, her body expelling something foul. She was crying. I was too. The woods echoed back. Our wails filled the forest. The gravel sunk into my palms as I scrambled over to Alice. Never had I felt so powerless, so lost. What entity could be stalking us, terrorizing us in ways we couldn't grasp? Alice's hair brushed my face. I heard the car door slam. I looked up. The tires screeched and the engine roared. The lighthouse disappeared into the forest.